uh, may I now hand over to you uh, to introduce yourself and each of the individual panelists. Hi, David. Thank you very much. Um, I'm the regional director for IOMA Africa, and we're helping companies wanting to enter the African market. You know, not just retail, but also other sectors, manufacturing, office uh, related. Uh, we, we supply market information, assist with premises and setting up. Um, so Aorma is a neutral resource for businesses and government. Um, and this webinar is one of a series that's been held every uh, second Thursday. And people can go visit the Aorma.com website for further um, webinars. So I would like to introduce Dr. Hunpo. Um, she is a sits on various boards, um, and I'll let uh, let her uh, introduce herself. Thank you. I am Pura Matlapeng. I'm a, a resident of Lesotho. I work for the Clinton Health Access Initiative, and at the president, I occupy the position of executive vice president responsible for implementation. I joined Clinton Health Access Initiative many years back in 2004 at the very beginning. And as you know, then Clinton Health Access was tasked with market shaping of all important commodities responsible for bringing HIV and AIDS into uh, Africa, bringing drugs and diagnostics, diagnostics into Africa. We still continue to do the market shaping work, working at the market site and also at the uh, implementation. I sit on several boards. I've just stepped down from the Anglo-American board three, four, five days ago. And I sit on Living Goods Board and Alliance Insurance Board. I think that's the short, the, the bit that I do. I might add also that my work primarily deals with advising governments, making sure that our work as Clinton Health Access uh, assists other organizations also to actually access important commodities. And as such, we have 80 governments to date who have signed in on the prices that we have negotiated. Thank you. <clears throat> well, that's interesting. Um, and then next, our next uh, panelist is Ian Thomas. He's the director for Crested Crane Connections. Hello, um, Ian Thomas. Um, I'm um, in this conference from England. And um, uh, first of all, could I wish everybody that's attending this the best of health in very, very difficult times and, and hope that you maintain that health. Um, my business, uh, for 22 years, I've been involved in consultancy in the UK on the uh, domestic and international stage with, uh, with manufacturers, mainly engineering companies, medical devices, uh, environmental products, but helping them grow. And uh, going back a few years ago, I, I met a gentleman from East Africa that convinced me that there was uh, uh, a lot to be had in, in dealing with in Africa. And so we set up Crested Crane Connections, which is uh, registered in Kampala in Uganda and also in the UK and England. And uh, basically, uh, it's uh, a vehicle to uh, assist companies in terms of investing into uh, that area of Africa um, or to export, to find distributors, uh, to generally trade, but also to bring a bit of legacy for the uh, individuals and, and employment opportunity for people in that region. Um, so in a nutshell, that's uh, Christy Crane Connections. Well, thank you very much for that, Ian. Um, I'm going to post the first question to the panelists and, you know, obviously COVID-19 and, you know, the effect it has and where it has been mostly and severely affected. Um, I'm from South Africa, so obviously there's a huge impact at the moment with COVID-19. Uh, we're not even sure if we're going to have an airline. Um, some retailers might not even reopen uh, after the lockdown restrictions. Some went into voluntary business rescue. So how did it impact 
both of you, uh, Mpo and Ian. Um, let's let's hear from from Mpo. And also in Africa, as you know, we are really surrounded by totally surrounded by by South Africa. We our I think we have been very fortunate that we are actually totally surrounded by South Africa. As a result, we've got double protection. We only recorded our first case yesterday. And that case, it just took too long to get the results back. It was a student coming back from Saudi Arabia and had stayed in South Africa, came back, and was not even, it was just checked because everyone was being checked. So we had double uh, protection because I must say, the protection that they, they, the measures that were put in place in South Africa uh, followed all the other measures that WHO had uh, uh, had uh, you know had asked countries to do, and we also doubly did the same thing. Uh, my my biggest problem is not the COVID itself that we are going to have a lot of people with COVID, but I think we will have a lot of people actually dying as a result of COVID, not because of of COVID. A lot of people are poor, out of work. As we speak, we already had 25% unemployment pre-COVID. Pre Our um, economy is very reliant on South African economy. A lot of uh, even retailers are all coming from South Africa. So if any people will lose work in South Africa, Lesotho is a certain. The same thing will be uh, replicated in Lesotho. Lesotho, you know, has um, a number of factories that follow the AGOA agreement of the United States. This, the, map, the way the factories are built are such that a lot of people are in one place. As a result, it's going to be very difficult to open up the factories immediately. So we have quite a number of people and we have a country with very unstable government as it is. So I think we are really going to have major problems because we have very poor catch nets for poor people, in indigent people, and people with disabilities. Um, we have a little bit of tourism. Again, if with all the airlines, not, not, I think in the next five years, we will not be back to where we were three months ago. And we, as long as the airlines are not functioning, as long as movement within the the, 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 the Africa and Europe and America is not in place. I don't think tourism will survive. And the same can be said for the wildlife. I think we really should be worried also for the wildlife. So people will die because of hunger. People will die because they're not afraid to move because of the COVID. So, and again, there is no way of moving. So um, uh, we, we, we really, whether we have it or not, it's not a, it's an issue. The question is, how can we then get out of this situation, all of us? Because it will not be just one country. Lesotho will not get out of it without South Africa, or Swaziland, or Botswana. Swaziland and Botswana at least share a border with other countries. We don't. Thank you for that. Um, Ian, your comments? Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that the points that Mpu brought up, uh, um, I thought were very, very valid. Um, the aspects of more people dying as a result of other things uh, and the limitations that COVID-19 uh, is putting on people, I think is very real. Um, certainly um, the lack of mobility of people to actually visit uh, uh, general practitioners and hospitals, etc., cetera, um, puts tremendous pressure on. Um, but poverty as well, uh, as was mentioned, and, and the political turmoil that, um, that Mpu mentions um, are, are very prevalent as well in, in parts of um, East Africa, particularly places like South Sudan, Burundi, and, uh, uh, and to a degree Tanzania. Um, what's, what is quite interesting is that in the whole of Africa, it's reported that there are under 2,500 deaths as a result. Um, now here in the UK, it's 10 times that, um, with a much smaller population. Um, but interestingly, a study today suggested that uh, COVID-19 um, doesn't flourish very well in warm and sunny conditions. Now, whether there's any truth behind that science or not, I don't know, but that may be, that may actually uh, determine why 
the relative figures of COVID incidents in Africa has been probably less than some other continents. Uh, for example, Kenya has reported 737 cases. That, those are figures as of six o'clock last night. Um, since the epidemic started, and Tanzania has um, has uh, reported about 509, uh, Uganda 139, but a much smaller population, Rwanda 287. So it, it makes you wonder really um, how these figures are being measured and where, what the accuracy is. Um, but it is quite interesting that the the deaths that have been recorded are, are relatively low. So it's, um, the question is, yeah, how, how do we get out of this? And um, uh, I, I think the word poverty that Mpu used earlier on is key and, and bringing people out of poverty um, by investment, overseas investment where possible, um, is a great route forward. Yes, I mean, if you may I jump in to yeah, sure, uh, please do. Yes, indeed. I mean, uh, uh, there has been epidemiologists have said that COVID or coronavirus has shown in the past to not survive well in warm climates. But let's remember, Italy is not cold; it's not that cold, and uh, and 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 also um, Spain, I think is not as cold as, as um, the rest of Europe. However, this particular coronavirus, very few people know. We don't know it. That, that, that is a fact. That is a fact. Most coronaviruses, we know that like any virus, as it moves on from one area to another, from let's say from animal to man, it's more virulent. As it acquires your DNA and it continues to move, it gets less and less virulent maybe that is a factor. That is also maybe a factor. Even South Africa, much as it's a, it's a hub, I expected to see more cases, but there aren't so many. And I must say, is the, the, the measures put in place by South Africa have actually been very good. We, I, I'm, I cannot fault them for something that we have not planned for. I cannot fault them. What surprised me is Nairobi. Now, Nairobi also being a, 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 a hub, as well as um, Addis Ababa. Addis Ababa also has shown fewer cases. However, we are applying exactly the same, mean, the same measures, protective measures that are, are, have been directed, we have been directed to do so by WHO. And I think we should not, uh, uh, you know, decide to just throw them away because we don't know. What then is going to happen is we are still killing the economy. Even if we are not, going to suffer like the rest of Europe or the United, the Americas, the, or Asia. We are still killing economy. That's the point. The question is, which businesses, are, where, who, who is going to survive corona, uh, this, this particular pandemic? What should we do to survive it? What are the measures that, what is the new kind of business, new life post-corona in short? Are they the businesses that will be addressing the immediate needs? Are, they, are those needs health related, for instance? Because we have seen now companies who were uh, producing top of the, 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 the range apparel, now sewing masks, preparing a PPE for, for, for doctors and nurses. So the, the question is, how do we get out of it? We who are poorer and in, in lower income countries, because we are we, we have forced by nature, by in fact, the very fact that we might die to stay at home and not work. There, there is um, one point I'd just like to, to briefly make uh, from what Mpu said just then. Um, she said that um, Italy and Spain are warm countries. Yes, that's, that's true. But um, both of these uh, epidemics were, were fairly strong in, in the northern part of Spain and in the northern part of Italy. Uh, the northern part of Italy is uh, very much affected by alpine weather. Um, and believe me, in February it can be very cold. And I once went to northern Spain uh, in March and the temperature was minus five degrees Celsius. So um, yes, these are very warm in the summer, these places, but um, 
but they, they do suffer some cold weather. So, uh, funny enough, an interesting question came through um, on the discussion, and the question was from Mark Bacon. He's asked if the, the deaths in Africa are so low because of the lack of testing or the amount of testing that has been done. So, Doctor, what is your opinion on the number of tests we've done in Africa? Are we, are we still below the average mark, or are we ramped up, are we in average, or is there still room for improvement on testing? Well, we have not tested. There are very few countries that have gone. South Africa is actually one of the best countries, and I think Kenya has done a better job. We are not. We have not. We are, we are testing people based on symptoms, mainly because in the very beginning we could not afford the tests. We were sending the tests to South Africa, so people were tested. But what I can assure you, I am part of the team that is surve surveillance team that is going around to check whether. The clinics are inundated with a number of people with flu-like symptoms. There is no such thing. And treatment in Lesotho, in clinics, is free. So it doesn't matter whether you come to, come to deliver a baby, it is still free. So people are not coming. They are allowed to go if they are sick, but they are not coming and they are not showing up because they are, not, they are just not sick. That's the point. And every, the, the person who was tested, was asymptomatic. And the person who was also tested who went back to South Africa and therefore was recorded as a South African, again was asymptomatic. So we, we, we don't know much about this virus. We, we don't know much about its behavior. My view is it will take us maybe another 10 months or so to be able to draw on to some, some studies that are, are being done. It's too, it's too early in the day to say this virus behaves like this, or so and so has done a better job than another one, or whether actually universal testing was necessary at all. Mm. It was necessary in places where it was very clear people are dying. It is necessary to do it in the United States now. People are still continuing to die, especially the elderly people. Thank you. So I think it leads up to the next question is, how is businesses reacting to the pandemic? Um, you know, you mentioned earlier about some companies making face masks. Um, you know, I'm looking at my clients. Some of them didn't even open and trade for like six weeks. Um, some of them only opening now tomorrow for the first time almost in two months, um, which is from a retail side. The guys are burning. Um, government in, in South Africa is, is assisting some companies with, with some funding. Um, and on the lockdown, for example, we've moved now from a level five to a level four. Um, what implications was in Uganda and, and, and uh, Lesotho? Did you guys uh, similar similar lockdowns easing up? Because I know Kenya is quite trading at the, the moment. The, the situation certainly in Uganda is, is a, quite a harsh lockdown at the moment. And um, industry in, in the main is ground to a halt. Um, Kenya as well has a lockdown. Um, Tanzania was a little bit slow to get to the party and um, a lot of misinformation, for example, that um, the virus didn't spread in God's house, so worship inside a church was fine. Um, those sort of messages didn't help the population of uh, Tanzania at all. and. Um, they were a bit slow and there's not good guidance in Tanzania, but, but certainly Uganda and, um, and Kenya have, have enforced a, a fairly rigorous shutdown, which is a lockdown, which has really caused uh, quite a lot of pain to, to uh, local manufacturing and small businesses, etc. Small and large businesses, of course. Yeah, we, we, we had only a harsh lockdown for two weeks. Total no movement. We were all totally no movement. Soldiers on the streets, everybody. No movement unless you were going to a hospital. And even then, they were accompanying you to the hospital or to the clinic. After that, when it was very clear that there isn't anything major happening, they relented a little bit. One person per vehicle, a driver and one person sitting at the back. And uh, even today, it's still like that. But uh, you still see, we, we still we see movement, but 
at about three o'clock, four o'clock p.m., there's practically nothing on the streets. The, the thing is, if people are afraid of this thing that is not even there, they are afraid. I believe Lesotho also being what it is, it copies everything that South Africa does. And for a good reason, we are similar. We are, we are almost in the same region. Uh, as for businesses, one thing that I saw happening, I, until, like I said, I just stepped down from the board of Anglo-American until very recently, I, went, I was on the sustainability board of, of the, the, the company and we were helping the mining world to op the mines to open up. And some of the, the measures that were taken by the DBS and uh, the platinum were very, very stringent. Letting people in, masks, sprays, how people were being sprayed, and uh, quite impressive. I, I actually have not seen a single company do a similar job. They've done a fantastic job. And uh, people are being tested on a regular basis. They, we, we worked with them. We have a very strong in, 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 in Chai um, a laboratory team that assists people to identify appropriate technology that can be used in any situation. So we worked with them to identify that technology. We worked with them to make sure that every mine is able to test people and people are rotating uh, well not to you know, allow other, others to, one team to meet the other team, something like that. Should there be infection, you should only be in one team. So I think the mines in South Africa will start, most of those who, who will, it's, it's expensive to do this, but it has been done in such a manner that I actually am, felt very proud that I was associated with the design of the program. Thank you for that. Um, so, Doctor, another question, actually more aimed to you, because you're coming from the medical field. Uh, where do you think will the medical resources be stretched the most? Um, if you look back at China, they had created this hospital at the time when it broke out. If I look at South Africa, I think with the lockdown here, it slowed the, the, the number of infections. It gave government enough time to make alternatives. Um, I spoke the other day to one of the medical professionals for example the trauma ward is quite empty they're using that space now for possible beds for COVID-19 um, so it looks like South Africa is, oh, is under control at the moment and how's Lesotho looking doctor? And, and you know why they're under control because of alcohol lack of alcohol right? Maybe yeah maybe for sure for sure hmm. I mean, the trauma ward is always full in Lesotho, Botswana, Swaziland, South Africa, Namibia, because of alcohol in the weekend. So the fact that they tightened on alcohol, I'm not, I mean, look, I wanted my wine too. Nobody wants me that they, everything will be closed down. But the, 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 the fact that alcohol was, was the factor that was taken out, believe me, it assisted this pandemic. It, it saved at least 20,000 lives, believe me. So I, I, would be, I would be very worried if countries started building hospitals or special units mm. or this, but I would like to, the world to, to rethink, to, to have a new thinking about a pandemic, airborne pandemic, and have at least some ready, whether it is not resources, but actually ready PPE or whatever stashed somewhere so that people can access them, that PPE, if and when it is necessary. This is not something that people have not been talking about for years. People have talked about that one day we will be hit by a pandemic that is airborne. Remember the famous speech of Bill Gates. He's not the only one who said that. This is more than five years. We have all known that something like that will do that because we are coming closer and closer to nature for no particular reason, actually. Why are people trying, test, trying new things that are not there, eating stuff that was not eaten before? So, and, and also going very, very close to consuming raw things. So this is one of the issues that uh, has brought us where we are today. No one has pinpointed where this virus comes from, but I wouldn't be shocked to find that it comes from 
some animal that was killed and eaten by some people. Ian, do you have any comments? Yeah, I, I, again, some very good points there. Um, I, I think one of the key things is that what we're missing, and this is not what Africa's missing, it's what the world is missing, is really a joined up approach to this whole thing. Um, because it's all very well to um, eliminate and, and, and deal with the, with the uh, pan pandemic in any country but um if you've eliminated it from one country and uh, there's still another half a dozen countries that uh, uh, have got the problem then that's still your problem mm. um so i i think that that should be looked at um, on a more sort of global scale um i i think that that's um critical to everybody um and uh, we're talking about this thing maybe coming back in waves or, or never being totally eradicated. It needs a joined up approach for, for many, many countries. And um, yep. uh, you know, it's um, uh, another interesting question that I've noticed on Q&A that's been asked is, is, is this, are the low figures due to the fact that the population is relatively young in Africa? And, and there could be some mm. truth in that as well. Um, and there could be, you know, a lot of people that are pre pretty fit and healthy that are actually carrying the virus and it's not really developed in, in any large way to cause them concern. Um, and that may be a, a, a function of the, the general age of, of, the, um, uh, of the population in Africa. Hmm. Well, if you look at the Africa pyramid, population pyramid versus um, it, uh, Italy's pyramid, you know, we've, South Africa's got more of a pyramid where Italy is a little bit wider on the top. Um, we've got a lot of young population in Africa um, where our older generations are much less of, a pop of the population. So I think that could be a difference as well, you know, between Italy and South Africa, for example. I really think people noticed that earlier on, actually, not, not, not even in Italy. Earlier on, even in, 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 while it was still in China, they noticed that young people are not as sick as old people. So mm. that, that definitely is a factor because uh, older people have underlying conditions like diabetes, hypertension, and the fact that they are, they are not as strong as the young population. But there are so many other hypotheses being thrown in. Have you heard the one about the BCG? The, the, the anti-TB anti vaccination that we get when we are, we yeah. are babies. You've heard that? Some people are saying that it has got some a protective. In fact, there is a study that is being carried out to figure out how many people, or what would be the percentage of people in countries where this is mandatory versus countries where it has not been. So, I mean, we, we don't know. I mean, like I said, most studies will only learn later. What is very glaring is what you've just said now. Really older people seem to be the ones that are more mostly affected. And I, I think also the way people live, I mean, I don't know, but in Lesotho people don't live in crowded spaces. So what has surprised me is about, uh, you know, like Kylie Shab and um, Soweto and other areas in South Africa where this has not hit hard. And because it, in Italy also people tend to gravitate towards very big families. Unless I'm wrong. I, and again, I'm looking at the fact that people, a lot of people who died were in the homes in the elderly elderly people's homes or old people's homes thank you for that one so dr dr Mpo earlier mentioned we will know more in the next 10 months um so we're talking about next year and if you know COVID 19 has affected all the economies it's brought south african economy to the knees um so Ian and Dr. Mpo, which, which countries do you think will bounce back quickly after this pandemic? 
Okay, in East Africa, um, the biggest economy in East Africa is Kenya, and it probably has the strongest international ties with um, uh, with the rest of the world. Um, so I think um, even though Kenya has been very badly hit, um, it's certainly got the work ethic and the and the um, the connections and and an economy that's a little bit more robust to be able to weather the storm. Uh, Uganda doesn't have the same size economy, but it has a tremendous entrepreneurial spirit, which um, uh, I read a report six months ago saying that um, Uganda was the most entrepreneurial country in the world. Now, you could argue that plus minus, however, and I'm not really sure how it was measured, um, but that at least way somebody has um, put pen to paper to suggest that that, that is the case. And my own experience there is that um, enterprise is, is very much part of the culture. And um, if a country is to succeed, then, then their opti optimistic spirit about things will, will, will help them bounce back. Tanzania is slightly um, uh, more reserved. Uh, does business in a different way, and um, I think Tanzania will take a little bit longer. Rwanda, of course, is well known as being um, uh, very forward-thinking in its uh, way of doing business, and, and that will certainly um, re recover, um, possibly quicker than the others, because it is smaller and able to be very uh, adaptable and forward-thinking. Um, and also the youth have a very big say in, in the way that country is going. Um, so, um, but as for South Sudan, which has um, got a lot of infrastructure problems and Burundi as well, um, they, those economies will continue to struggle, there's no doubt about it, and would have been hit hard by what's happened. Thank you for that. I I really think I really think a lot of uh, countries were before COVID nineteen were already struggling. I mean, South Africa was already struggling with other mm. issues. So if we, we, we take that those out, South Africa is still a very strong economy. It it will struggle. It will need some help to get out of this. But I think South Africa will, as long as it, it can reset their mindset, uh, reset their priorities and address the issues, the real issues that matter to people, I think the, 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 the economy will, will, will prosper. I, we are not talking about Nigeria. I don't know why we are not talking about Nigeria. Of all these countries, I think Nigeria will be the one that might just come out very strong uh, economically. That Nigerians are not afraid of um, challenges. They are, they are very entrepreneurial. I heard you talk about Ugandans, but I, I, would, I would argue that to say maybe similar, I, I do work in Uganda as well, but, uh, but uh, I, th I think Nigerians would probably, they, they, this is the time for them to actually show that they're actually equal to South Africa, if not better than South Africa. Small countries like ours will depend very much still on, on, on the, 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 the regional big brothers like South Africa, Nigeria, uh, Ghana, Kenya, we will still depend on them. And how we prosper is also how we, if we address the real things, you will not believe that it, as I speak to you now, Lesotho is in a process of actually changing the government in the middle of COVID. So, you know, as for as long as we are focusing on the wrong things, that nothing will happen for, for these countries. The other issue that I wanted to you to, to, to maybe address, not, not to be addressed by a health person, but by all of us, is the position of health in economy. Is it, is it fair or is it proper that even in budgets, health is always the last on the list? And then when we are hit as hard as we are hit now, health is the least prepared. So in my view, you talked about the world getting itself prepared. Yes, there is a team already that is working. I know WHO is being vilified, I think, unfairly. There is a team that has already been chosen that is working with the big companies and the other big countries that want to do so 
to prepare different regions for any something similar to, to COVID, whether it is airborne or whether it is waterborne that can happen in the near future. So I know for a fact that there is something like that is happening and hopefully people will, the pleasures that have been made, they will, they will, they will, they will, they will, they will be good on those pleasures. Thank you for that. So if, you, if we're going to look at sectors, um, which sectors even now and post COVID-19 do you think will be more open for overseas investments? Um, besides, you know, obviously the healthcare, um, is there other sectors that might be open for investments? I, I think um, certainly uh, agriculture is a big area. Um, it's forecast that by 2025, uh, the, um, the whole of Africa will have an imbalance with regard to food imports of £110 billion per year, um, which is colossal really. And um, this is with a growing population. Um, so agriculture is, is a key area. Um, Uganda, for example, is a net um, exporter of agriculture. Um, and has several, in, in some instances, up to three growing seasons of certain crops um, and um, very, very fertile soils and um, no shortage of uh, water. So it's, um, it's ideally suited. Um, but farming is relatively simple. It's uh, using outdated equipment and it does need investment and it needs really some big players to come in. Um, minerals are another area. Um, tourism. Um, Tanzania and uh, Uganda and Rwanda, uh, sorry, Tanzania, Kenya and uh, Rwanda have done very well with tourism. Um, other places, um, for example, Uganda has not been good at tourism. So, uh, tourism, hospitality, um, better quality hotels and things like that. Um, manufacturing, definitely. This is where I see jobs being created for local people that can allow them to um, pull themselves away from the breadline, from poverty. Um, transport, logistics, a lot of that will come with um, investment in manufacturing. Um, and um, healthcare, of course, we've talked about healthcare. Um, certainly throughout East Africa, there's, there's, uh, that's a good area to invest in. Um, information technology um, and, and education. Uh, those really are the, the key areas that I would see as being big areas for investment in East Africa. So so just uh, coming back to the manufacturing side, um, I know a while back Zimbabwe, government tried to empower manufacturing in Zimbabwe to give tax breaks and tax benefits. Um, are other countries in East Africa doing the same? Giving yes. Um, yeah, in, in, um, in some instances, um, if you're employing people, you, you can get free land. Um, in other instances, you can get uh, up to a 10 years um, holiday from corporation tax. Um, obviously, you have to show that you've got continuity of employing people, but um, yeah, these those incentives do exist, and um, you know, I, I do personally see an opportunity here for Africa um, because people are becoming more and more educated in Africa. They're probably more educated than they've ever been in, in the past. Um, the, the population is growing, they want to work, those that do work have got a very good work ethic and China, um, which does a lot of manufacture for the rest of the world, um, as, as in, in my mind has let the world down very, very badly with, with what has happened um, and it's also tried to rescue the situation by providing um, protection equipment and test kits that have been faulty. Um, no other way of putting it. 
So I, I think the confidence in, in China, is, is, uh, and, and this is very true in the USA, for example, has been hit very, very badly. And um, I see this as an opportunity for Africa to put a united front together to, to, to actually pick up a lot of manufacturing uh, from the Western world. Um, and, you know, because it's got the workforce, it's got, a, it's got a young workforce, it's got people that want to work and it needs to create its own wealth and that in itself will spur investment. So that's my thoughts. I agree with you on, on quite a number of issues, if you would say, but I, I want you to expand on, on talk. In my book, as I was listing what will actually come back first, tourism is the last. Mm. It, it, it is not, it, it, it is a great opportunity, but unfortunately it will be the last to come back because it depends on quite a number of issues. One, safety, two, movement, by aeroplanes, which I don't know whether people will be able, will feel free enough and brave enough to get into aeroplanes and go for, for a safari somewhere. So when you're talking about manufacturing, I totally agree. Food and food industry is going to be stronger. That's one of the issues that people will be looking up to. And those countries and those industries that will focus on food, that is actually a necessity for those nations will be the one that will be, uh, that, will, that will make a difference. But I don't just think because we want to go for a safari, we will go. Even I from Lesotho will not go to Kenya to go to a safari. I'll be going there to maybe to work or do something. Not yet. Right now, I think we are all very cautious. It will come last. We'll have to build confidence and make sure that we are investing money in things that people actually want, are useful, useful to the nations that we are uh, working with. Yeah, I, I, I accept your points on, on the tourism, it was very well put. And uh, um, I, I, I guess this, was, this would have been the list that, that one would have uh, spoken about very, very confidently uh, six months ago. Um, mm. and, and you're right, tourism does get pushed to the bottom of that list that I, that I gave earlier on, I, well put. Well, if I look, for example, in South Africa, we're not even allowed to uh, travel domestically. Um, I cannot get to Cape Town, besides not even by plane or a car. Uh, South Africa is only opening up international travel around about level one. So we don't even know when we're going to get to level one. Um, at this point, we're still stuck at level four. They, there is talk that we might get to level three by the end of, end of May. Um, but we'll still see. Um, there was an interesting question that came through, which is related to what we talked about, um, the indices that will, you know, from foreign investment. So Fred asked, uh, we obviously interested in trade and business opportunities. How do we put the COVID situation aside and take advantage of business opportunities in this environment? I think that's a very valid question. Well, you know, I mean, we probably could, but the question is, are we set up to be able to, to operate with any form of business with all these restrictions in, in, in that we have to place in, play, in, 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 the, in, the, in the workplace? Are we able to do so? I, I, don't, I don't know whether many, a lot of countries can work you know, in, in a factory that normally had 100 people, or then you can have maybe 50. I don't know whether we are able to take um, advantage of that. I, I, I would imagine the, the one thing that we should take advantage of is um, trading through the internet and doing things like that. But uh, I, I, I don't see how, how, how we can smartly take advantage of that. And there aren't many investors out there right now looking out to invest in, in this climate. And if they are there, Honestly, then they, they would, then they will know they will have the solutions as to how, what they would want to see happen. Yeah, I, I think there's that's some very valid points that was raised there, um, and I, I agree with that. Um, quite interestingly, I, I had a number of Zoom uh, conferences with um, different investors, 
And um, what I've noticed in, in every instance, and, and I'm not an, an investor, I'm not a financial person, but what I have noticed is, is there's not been any shortage of appetite uh, for investing in Africa. Um, what has been clear is that now is not the right time, which, which doesn't surprise anybody listening to this. Uh, but they've all suggested that Africa still presents opportunities for investment. And um, this is just maybe um, a hurdle to get over um, so that um, matters can be returned to normal. Now, I, I, I don't for one minute think that life will return to the, the normal that we all knew. I think there will be, going forward, there will be various different things that we have to do. But um, and I, I have noticed quite encouragingly that, that investors are, are not shutting the door. They've, um, they've, they're, they're just sort of hanging on in there until such time as uh, uh, matters have improved. Um, now, that may be a, a, a generalisation, but it certainly reflects the views of those that I've spoken to. And in, in the last two weeks, there must have been six or seven different investment houses that, that I've had Zoom conferences with. So um, there we go, an observation. And I think that could bring us to the next question as well about mobile technology and internet. Um, when I did a seminar last year, the world average you know, guy spending time on the internet is six hours 42. South Africa was at eight hours 25 um, per day, where the Philippines were 10 hours. Um, I'm sure that increased during COVID. My question I want to say is with mobile, mobile phone and ownership, has there been an increase on online shopping? Um, I know for a fact in Ghana, Ghana had the lockdown and there's some restrictions uplifted, retail is back to normal. However, the guys are still doing a lot of online shopping, even with the normal retail stores that has opened. Um, your experience, Ian, doctor? Okay, I, I, I'll be fairly brief on this one. Um, from what I understand that um, most people have been reduced to um, shopping for day-to-day -day necessities. And um, those that have been sort of uh, stuck in their homes um, have had to order through mobile apps and things like that, just the basics, which are, which are then delivered um, on, a, on a daily or, a, or every other day basis, depending on where they are. Um, so there is a little bit of movement with regards to those supplies to the general population. Um, but it's, um, you know, online shopping is uh, uh, certainly not like the online shopping we would know in, in the West. Um, and um, it, it has been limited to, you know, um, dare I say it, bread, butter, fruit, and, uh, uh, and meat, etc. Uh, the, the, the commonality, the, the common things that one would need to survive. The, the, the online shopping, the, the only, there the are very few countries that you, you can evaluate effectively in Africa whether they are the proper job when it comes to online shopping and South Africa is one of them. And the biggest disappointment was that say with Amazon, shopping from Amazon, the packets, packages were being stolen. If you know, you have heard about that. Quite a number of packages were being stolen and people were having so many problems with that. And um, I know because I have a lot of relatives who live in South Africa, and as a result, that has not taken off as much as it could have. The other issue is the issuance of credit cards to ordinary people. And you know, because of the problems that they, the credit card companies had in the United States, that filtered down to almost everybody, to us in Africa. So it's not everyone who has a credit card. People have bank cards, uh, which are credit cards. As no, not all of them can shop online, but you will see in places like Johannesburg, I mean, like my daughter lives in Johannesburg and she will be 
using Uber for eating, for doing all sorts of things with Uber. So that, that is, that is um, uh, online shopping for certain people is easy, but it's only maybe 10%, 20% of South Africans. So I don't know whether we can, when we're talking of online shopping, we should be talking about people in Tabazimbi being able to get to, to do online uh, shopping or people in Maseru right up in the mountains in Mokotlung being able to do it. Only then can we say it has gone up or down. It's just not an issue that is open to them at this point in time. Well, I think that, could, that also brings me to the next question that, you know, with Iorma and the University of London working together on these PhD students on the, on the Technic, uh, uh, you know, technical side, uh, technology side. What do you think about that program? Uh, I'm not sure if you're from, familiar with concept uh, Conception X, um, Doctor in Ian. That you, did you guys, um, are you aware of it? I, I'm not aware of it, but from I, since I saw it, I've done a mm. little bit, a little bit. I think it's fantastic. I really so, think it's, it, it's uh, but you, it is very. Simple what is being offered also in the US by other universities. But it, it, I don't know why London being sort of who we look to here, the Anglophone Africa, uh, it, it became very hard to go to, as, as you remember, it, it became very hard to go and study in, in England when you came from Africa. Mm. Uh, and you couldn't even get a scholarship to go and study in, in, in England because it was just not possible in terms of, it was very expensive. However, if we can find a way of funding that, that will make a change, a difference, a huge difference. Yeah, I, uh, likewise, I, I didn't know too much about this until I, I saw the, uh, the recent communication on this. Um, looking at it, it's, um, it, it needs encouragement, there's no doubt about it, it uh, to um, transfer knowledge and experience um, and give people entrepreneurship skills um, is very important. And um, I, I would certainly, uh, when some normality returns, uh, if it ever returns, um, be very much behind this. So I, I think um, uh, developing these um, learning opportunities is not just about learning, but it's about the legacy and the relationships it can build and the, the opportunities um, to create things that are bigger than the sum of the parts, uh, which are always um, keen to encourage. Um, so yeah, um, it says here providing opportunities for, uh, to African investors, uh, facilitating deeper trade relationships between the UK and Africa, very, very important. And um, I, I um, looking looking at Conception X. It's um, it's well thought out and um, uh, needs um, needs some, some impetus behind it. But um, clearly, when uh, when travel is so restricted, um, there's little that can be done at this moment in time, and uh, little appetite that industry has got where it's struggling to survive to support it at this point in time. But um, hopefully that's just a, uh, a transient period where th that we come out the other side. And we can plan while we are, we are preparing, right? Mm. So yeah, and this, I, I will also answer one of your questions or your, or your remarks about China. Uh, if if you, you, you think of a situation where a country like Lesotho regarded themselves as Basutu and English at the same time. Can you imagine? All of a sudden when you are told you can no longer go to England, yet you're holding a British passport. That's another thing. So Britain did not take advantage of its colonies or its former partners. I want to call them partners for, mm. uh, for, for, for so that it, it sounds a little bit nicer. Not only that, they left nothing in these countries. So to, to look down upon China, I'm not saying China is doing all the good things. There are some things that, are, that we, are, we can learn from China. There are things that are, we should absolutely never adopt from China, or we should stop them from doing in our countries. But Britain 
Not only did they leave places like Lesotho, which, which were colonies, and Swaziland, they actually removed their embassies. They left and left and left. They only came back last year, just before the Brexit. So what I'm saying to you is, there is no point in looking at another country that is, if, if, if a country is poor, it will look for help anyway. Anyway, we have now people here in this country, in my country, in Lesotho, who are very, who, who can speak Chinese, like the Chinese too, because they offer them free scholarships to go and study the language and study other things. I, I, I am not going to say China is not taking out from us and a lot from, especially the minerals from other countries, but it is. And it really, leaving the countries poorer, I don't think Britain left us any richer. That's, that's a fact. I, I, I think I would say... Uh, or not, not even powers to move forward. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with a lot of those points. And um, um, I uh, was in a meeting with uh, President Museveni in um, January in London. And um, he, um, he quite rightly said, why did Britain turn its back on Africa when it joined the common market? And um, I'm old enough to remember that, sadly. Um, and uh, we were, at the time, Britain was very much, saw its future as with Europe. Um, and I think um, when we realized that it was just a, a, a move to create the United States of Europe, which, which nobody in Britain really wanted, um, then that was a good time to sort of move away. But, but in the meantime, we had neglected people that were part of what we termed as the Commonwealth and, and people that we had long relationships with. And I don't think anybody's particularly proud of that in England or in, in the UK. Um, we want to make things right and we want to bring some legacy as well to, to the people of Africa where possible. But yeah, you, you are 100% right with what you say. Yeah, so whatever we do now is, is, is to make sure that our traditional roots that we understand well, we work on them well, we encourage people, our own people, to go and if, if we can still have those relationships back, learn, I mean, that would be fantastic. Almost everyone in my, my, my family has studied in Britain. It, it, it is important to, 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 to realize that Africans are react, are very, very, react very, very negatively to being looked down at. Yes, we, 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 we do need to be assisted here and there. But look, even countries that are well off, like the United States, look how they are struggling with, 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 with the, this pandemic. They are really doing a worse job than South Africa, if you were to compare. Um, we're now running towards the scheduled end of the uh, webinar. Um, perhaps we should just look at one or two of the questions that have uh, come mm. through since we, uh, we started. Uh, we've had 14 questions, so it's been very, uh, uh, very busy with uh, questions and, uh, and, and comments. So I'll just try and see if there's any question. I don't know whether you can run through them as well, Vikas. And sure. That, um, no, I'll do. Um, yeah. I think I'll just start from the top. Um, we we'll probably have two minutes. Uh, could doctor comment on the success or otherwise of global health and pharma initiatives and their relevance in Africa or to Africa? That was from Charlotte. So uh, what, uh, what I will say, Charlotte, is the only example that I can give as a success is the success to be able to, of the market shaping work that we did, when it comes to uh, HIV and AIDS. Yes, more majority of these products were not manufactured in Africa. They were manufactured out of Africa. We have had some initiatives to try and manufacture our own drugs in Africa. And the first initiative was actually in Uganda. And I, I'm not going to talk about South Africans, South Africa, because most of the South African manufacturing companies are actually um, part of the manufacturing companies that are in Switzerland and elsewhere in the world. And uh, so I don't think as Pharma, Pharma Africa, it's something like that exists. Let me see the question again. 
no, the first one. Global health and pharma initiatives and their mm. relevance to they they are relevant. Okay, so it doesn't not she wasn't necessarily mean talking about manufacturing in Africa. I think it it has taken it takes fourteen hour phone calls. It takes months and months of negotiation to negotiate not only the active pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical ingredient, to negotiate with whoever is manufacturing that particular drug that we feel will make a difference to the rest of the world, not only just Africa, by the way. So once we have done that, we have been successful to sign in 80 countries worldwide, well, worldwide, majority of them in Africa. I know there was only one country, the country that had not signed in was Botswana, but ultimately it did sign in. To be able to access this crisis, it took us as Chai to put people in the ministries of health, in the ministries of finance, to walk through every procurement to see how long. You'll be surprised to find in some countries we found 70 steps to be able to, you know, to, to complete one procurement process. We did this, we continue to do it even today. We do it quietly. We are not making noise about it because it's not ours, it's for the particular country. Is it successful? Yes, I think it's successful. Because to date, I do not know a single country where we can say this particular country has not been able to buy ARVs. As a result, even people who are on ARVs are lacking. Where there are shortages, we are still, you know, we're looking at, at what people are, countries are doing and what they're procuring. We, you may find that the city has more and therefore we ship it to, to Zimbabwe or we ship it elsewhere. It is successful. Successful and this success is not only ours, it's success of the governments, success of the partners who are assisting us to, to buy and success of the donors who are uh, being the guarantors. Bill Gates has been one of the biggest guarantors DFIT has been a guarantor. A, a Sweden government has been a guarantor. So when it comes to that, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of dedication. And if you can see the teams that run around and do this work, they are your young people who are educated, who are paid, and who work 16-hour shifts to be able to procure something that, is, that will make a difference to Africa. If it is not trans, it's going to not make a difference to the rest of the world, we will not waste our time on it. We will do it. Right now, we are following the vaccine discovery or development. Let me say we are following vaccine development. It's already in three, there are three already very promising vaccines for this uh, COVID-19. I can assure you, as soon as we see who Anyone who moves ahead a little bit, we now we, we start mobilizing funding for that person, for that particular company to make to move as fast as possible. And we are not doing it for anybody else except for the developing world. This I can assure you. This is what we are doing. We have been successful at this. If I have gray hairs on my head, it is because some of the work that we have done of this market shaping, I've spent hours and hours on end making sure that this, this happens. Not just me. We have an incredible team that is doing this work and it is doing it very, very well and not looking for any wonderful, you know, reward afterwards. They just work like anybody else. You won't even know them when you see them. You just see that people are there working. Team, teams and teams and teams working from all over the world. So pharma in Africa has not been fair, but pharma respects us. Pharma knows that if we, we talk to you, we already know how much you are making. We already know how much profit you have made from us. And therefore, we are asking you nicely, lower your prices. It's not easy to say someone should lower the price from $320 per month to bring it down to $5 a month. That takes a lot of work. We have done it. And I think we'll continue to do it. Thank you. Um, there's another question uh, from John. Uh, are individual African governments acting separately or in cooperation? Jan, do you have comments on that? Yeah, um, I, I think um, from what I'm seeing, um, that is very much the same here in Europe. Um, 
governments are looking after their own interests uh, and developing their mm. own approaches. Um, although I know that um, there has been a Pan-African COVID response task force put together, um, which I, I, I guess in, in one way is actually more advanced than what is happening in, um, in Europe. Uh, and when I say Europe, I mean the broader Europe, not just the EU. Um, but um, uh, from what I'm seeing, the, um, whether this is being taken on board by the governments is another matter, but certainly the, the task force that, that, cover, that crosses numerous borders within Africa, I know has been active. Um, but, I, but I think uh, Dr. Mpu may be better positioned to answer that, que that particular question than me at this point. Which, which is? Which one? Which one is this? What, which question is this? <laughs> uh, with regard to cooperation <laughs> between governments uh, on the on the COVID nineteen. When, when it comes to this, this pandemic, a World Health Organization has done a fantastic job and has made sure that all governments are are, are cooperating. There's this co cooperation, but I have to tell you, for the first time, I saw big countries holding, including China. They've been holding back. They are holding their stocks and hoarding things. So, uh, yeah, cooperation up to a point, up to a point. This, this is one time when we saw that everyone felt the pinch and everyone was fighting for himself first. Getting PPE out of Hong Kong, China was very, very tough. But finally, when they realized that they were over the curve, they were able to do so. If there is a, 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 a vaccine, like I said, and it's going to be uh, only for a particular country, we are going to put up a fight. Africans should put up a fight. They should help us put up a fight. It is important that if there is a vaccine, is accessible to the entire world. There are far too many vaccines in the world that are helpful and that actually you would be surprised. The viruses have been harvested right here in Africa, but we are not able to, to pay for them because now these vaccines are very, the, 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 the vaccines are very expensive. However, this particular one has taught us a good lesson. We, 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 we live, this is a truly global a pandemic, so we must have a global initiative to address it. I, I, I agree that the vaccine um, should be cross-border. Um, as I said, this is a world problem and, and um, making it affordable is important. I, I also understand the drivers with regard to pharmaceutical research and, and the millions and billions it costs to, to actually bring a new compound to the marketplace and, and um, uh, the regulatory aspects that go with it uh, are very, very stringent um, and limiting and um, co very, very costly. So I, under I understand both sides of the argument, but um, there's no point in um, vaccinating the whole of Europe um, and not doing Asia and not doing Africa and not doing Australasia. It's not going um, to happen. It, it's, 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 not got, it's got. It's got to happen. It will not happen like that. No, I, I, it is I know. Not. I, yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, there's, um, a there's a question. This is a I world problem. This is, this is not a country it's, problem. It is a world problem and have, it has always, health has always been a world problem. Has always been. So there, there is a question that I think someone wants you to, to answer about that EU is pro a protectionist. What will it take for EU to lower its tariffs? Well, the EU has always been very uh, um, set on its ways, and uh, I I agree with you one hundred percent. Yeah. So, what are we going to do to 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 to, to show EU that if they need our own uh, products from Africa, they need to lower the tariffs. Well, the EU has got its own problems at the moment because COVID-19 COVID is pulling the EU apart at the moment. 
and uh, there are uh, a lot of um, unlevel playing fields in Europe that are causing a lot of frictions and um, it would not surprise me if in 18 months e COVID-19 may be the death of the EU but uh, uh, don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> No, the, the only thing, if from the point of view of a, of a, um, a, a doctor and a, a one who has seen how these things evolve, even if we have another COVID-19, it will not kill people. It will be milder. So it will be just like flu. So it will be like SARS, you know, like what we had with mm -hmm. SARS. So I, 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 don't, I do not believe that we could have something as drastic as this again. I do not believe. It's evolving. Like everything else, it evolves. So I, I hope to I hope and pray that we don't have something distrusting. I have never seen the number of coffins. You know, they, there was a, a very dramatic, uh, you know, piling of coffins with people with bodies in Italy. That actually gave gave, gave me nightmares. So I don't think uh, we should have something like that. I don't think it will be like that. But let's prepare. Let's prepare for something else that might come. Are we ready to prepare for that? Um, I think we should wrap up. Uh, David asked us to wrap up. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to all the questions. Um, could we email the attendees the answers to the questions, uh, David? Uh, yes, I think the plan is that after the event, uh, the questions will be placed on the IORMA blog. Um, and mm -hmm. so the panelists can have a chance to answer the questions after the event and post it all to the IORMA blog and make those answers accessible to everyone. There will be a recording of the, uh, the, the event, uh, which will be uh, published on the IOMA website and also on YouTube, so people will be able to refer to it afterwards. Mm. Um, and so the next uh, date of the next uh, webinar is going to be Thursday the 28th at uh, 2 p.m. So um, I think on, on behalf of um, IOMA, and on behalf of uh, all of the um, uh, panelists and all of the participants, I would like to just say thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you very much for the panelists for their expertise. So some really interesting conversations that uh, were going on, some very insightful comments. And from the participants, we've had some very good questions, which unfortunately we weren't able to deal with completely uh, during this session but we will be dealing with them through the IOMA blog and uh, possibly future events. So thank you once again for uh, joining us today. Please take time to complete the little survey form that comes up when you uh, leave this event. And we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.